Hi, everyone. It's Dave. Before we start today's CyberWire podcast, I want to let you all know about a new podcast we're excited to be producing in partnership with our friends at Recorded Future. It's focused on threat intelligence. It comes out once a week, and we hope you'll check it out and help spread the word. You can search on iTunes for Recorded Future or visit recordedfuture.com slash podcast. Thanks in advance for checking it out, and we'd love to know what you think. Now here's our show. U.S. strikes against Syrian targets and harsh words for Assad are followed by apparent Russian information operations as bilateral tensions mount. Both WikiLeaks and the shadow brokers resurfaced late last week. Dallas emergency sirens were hacked early Saturday. And Spanish police collar the alleged spam king. Time to thank our sponsor, Palo Alto Networks. You can visit them at go.paloaltonetworks.com slash secure clouds. With the adoption of software as a service applications, data now lives beyond the traditional network perimeter. What are you doing to keep your organization's data protected in this new environment? Palo Alto Networks' integrated platform provides detailed software as a service visibility and granular control, data governance, automated risk remediation, and malware prevention, so organizations can achieve complete cloud security even in SaaS applications. Palo Alto Networks has the broadest, most comprehensive cybersecurity for all cloud and software as a service environments, because secure clouds are happy clouds. Find out how to secure yours at go.paloaltonetworks.com slash secure clouds. And we thank Palo Alto Networks for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Monday, April 10th, 2017. Kinetic operations, again, have co-committant information operations. U.S. Tomahawk strikes hitting Syrian government installations in response to the Assad regime's use of chemical agents, probably the lethal nerve agent Sarin, against domestic and largely civilian targets. The strikes and hardline U.S. rhetoric against Assad in the U.N. and elsewhere have strained U.S.-Russian relations, and the information operations that have emerged in response have Russian fingerprints all over them. The shadow brokers are back, this time with files they claim are NSA passwords. The group resurfaced with unpleasant things to say about U.S. President Trump, the scriptwriter's broken English of their communique saying that they're no longer his supporters and that he's abandoned his base. To quote them, The shadow brokers voted for you. The shadow brokers supports you. The shadow brokers is losing faith in you. Mr. Trump helping the shadow brokers, helping you is appearing you are abandoning your base, the movement, and the peoples who's getting you elected." End quote. We leave out a great deal more that could have come from, say, Pepe the Frog, but the tone is a shrill example of the fringiest alt-right themes. Oh, and the shadow brokers also say they've taken an oath to protect and defend against enemies foreign and domestic, which is, of course, a riff on the U.S. military oath. So, President Trump has either fallen out of favor with the shadow brokers, presumably Russian masters, or that he was never in that much favor to begin with. Motherboard, often in communication with the brokers, has asked for clarification, but received none. The shadow brokers again deny they have anything to do with the Russian government, but essentially, no one believes them. Edward Snowden, who knows something about leaks and scandals, appears to think the shadow brokers might have overplayed their hand. He tweeted Saturday that, quote, There's still so much here NSA should be able to instantly identify where this set came from and how they lost it. If they can't, it's a scandal, end quote. Al Mazdar News, an outlet based in the UAE but generally regarded as closely aligned with Syria's Assad regime and thus a mouthpiece for Russian policy in the area, claimed Friday it was the victim of a cyber attack that originated somewhere in the U.S., No other sources appear to have taken notice of the allegation, so the claimed attack may be disinformation. At the end of last week, WikiLeaks issued another smaller tranche of what purport to be CIA documents, but these don't arrive with the eclat that accompanied earlier releases. They're generally being perceived as leaks intended simply to do damage to U.S. intelligence services without the aura of whistleblowing that colored some earlier WikiLeaks dumps. After all, people say, the CIA is in the business of collecting foreign intelligence. 
and the Dudgeon is too studied, too manufactured, like Captain Renault's shock at learning there's gambling in Casablanca. Tomorrow is Patch Tuesday, and Microsoft will probably, observers think, issue a relatively light set of fixes. Among them, however, is expected to be a patch for an Office Zero Day being actively exploited in the wild. Wrapping up our daily podcast coverage of the recent Women in Cybersecurity Conference, today we hear from Kathleen Smith, Chief Marketing Officer for CybersecJobs.com and ClearedJobs.net. She shared her perspective as a recruiter on where prospective employees should be focusing their efforts. If you understand the technical and can do the technical, that's great. What's really needed right now are the people that understand the business, the people that can understand how to explain the risk that is being presented to the company, how to gather the teams, those skills are still very important. So someone getting into the workforce, that's really great that you've got the certifications, it's really great that you know maybe you know Python or Kali Linux or something like that, but if you can't explain yourself to your manager, you're going to have a problem moving on in your career. So do take that time to do a Toastmasters, to put together a presentation and go to a meetup. Uh, really work on your writing skills. It's amazing how many people are, are not working on their writing skills. I think the other thing is reverse recruiting. Uh, this is a term that sort of popped up over the last year or so. And many of security managers are saying, you know, I have recruiters that are helping me find talent, but recruiters aren't trained on what cybersecurity is. And I know a lot of people are very frustrated with recruiters who don't understand the technical components, but maybe take a step back and explain to a recruiter exactly what you do. Explain, you know, be, instead of reverse engineering, reverse recruiting. This is why you need me. These are the skills that I can bring to you. You have in this job description these things that you need to do. You know, can we take this offline and do you really understand what this is? Because I think we'll be able to make a difference in the workforce gap if we have job seekers who really are willing to be patient and explain to recruiters, you know, you actually contacted me about pen testing. And that's not really what I do. Mm. You know, maybe take, you know, a little pity on one out of every 10 recruiters that gives you a bad approach and explain to them, do you know why this isn't going to work? And maybe, you know, we can have a different kind of conversation. I do think that we're unfortunately being impacted by buzzwords. And I've been part of many of the scholarship review community, uh, committees, and I'm really concerned with the number of people who want to come into cybersecurity, and they're doing it just because they see the buzzword. Realize that if you're going to take on a career, it has to be something that inspires and you're passionate about. Don't go after a career just because you know it's on the headlines and it's a buzzword and you know they say that there's this skills gap. I mean, there are many other industries that could use your talent and you would be much more happy. Um, so I, I was a little discouraged when I've been part of several of the scholarship committees and seeing people who submit an application and their heart is just not in it. Please don't do that to yourself and please don't do that to the community. That's Kathleen Smith from CybersecJobs.com and ClearedJobs.net. You can hear more from her in our upcoming CyberWire Women in Cybersecurity Conference Special Edition. In industry news, Okta issues an IPO, the first major IPO in the cybersecurity sector this year. The company seeks to raise $187 million at a unicorn's valuation of $1.5 billion. Hackers set off emergency warning sirens in Dallas, Texas, early Saturday morning. These are the sirens residents of the U.S. Atlantic and Pacific coasts tend to think of as air raid sirens and regard as relics of the Second World War, if they think of them at all. But in Tornado Alley, between the Appalachians and the Rockies, they see serious and regular use in warning people that tornadoes are in the area and that they should take cover, so this is far from a harmless prank. The city shut down the sirens at about 1.20 a.m. Saturday, and despite their best efforts to convince people there was no emergency, the Dallas 911 system was flooded with calls to the extent that callers experienced waits as long as six minutes. Dallas is investigating and has confirmed that it was a system compromise, not a mere glitch. Whoever was responsible is believed to be in the Dallas area. 
Spanish police have arrested the alleged spam king, Pyotr Levashov. Mr. Levashov, a Russian national who operated under the nom de hack Pyotr Sevira, that is, Peter of the North, and was associated with the Kelahos botnet. The St. Petersburg native is wanted practically everywhere, but especially in the U.S. He was vacationing in Spain with his family. Interestingly, Russian news outlet RT has suggested that Mr. Levashov is behind much of the election messaging the Russian government denies having anything to do with. The U.S. Justice Department says it's interested in Mr. Levashov as a criminal, not as an agent of influence. Time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Control Risks. For 41 years, across over 130 countries, Control Risks has partnered with the world's leading companies to help them succeed in complex physical, political, and virtual risk environments. They've been with their clients as risks have evolved, from kidnapping in the jungles of Colombia to extortion by cyber attack. In an increasingly interconnected world, cyber risks are everywhere you operate. Control Risks has a comprehensive view of cybersecurity as a business risk within a context of geopolitical, reputational, regulatory, and competitive complexity. And thanks to their unique heritage, they provide clarity and actionable guidance that only decades of risk experience can bring. Control Risks brings order to chaos. Let them show you what over 40 years in the risk business has taught them. Find out more at controlrisks.com slash cyberwire. That's controlrisks.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Control Risks for sponsoring our show. Joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Joe, you're familiar with the uh, GPS navigational software Waze. Yes, I myself am Waze royalty. Waze is uh, expanding. They're joining um, uh, the Smart Device Link Consortium, which is a group that works with automakers and developers on open source protocols right. um, for connecting smart devices to cars. Okay. And so this means that the Waze app will be on your built-in screen on your car. Right. That's a good thing. Yep. But the interesting thing about this is that it means that Waze will also be able to get more data from the vehicle itself. Right. The app will have information to things like fuel levels, yep. whether or not the wiper blades are on, right. how hard you're applying the brakes. And this all has very real and, and potentially beneficial outcomes. If up ahead of me, a quarter of a mile, seven people who are Waze users all slam on their brakes, something has happened, maybe Waze could in real time notify me that something there's a hazard on the road ahead. Right. Or if I'm running low on gas, Waze can say, you're running low on gas, you want to find a gas station. Sure. But, you know, there are uh, some privacy concerns. Like, what's to say, hey, you're running low on gas, why don't you go to my advertiser's gas station up here? Right, right. Uh, well, and also I can imagine, you know, what happens uh, with insurance companies and potential litigation. You know, you get in an correct. accident and are they going to subpoena the information from Yeah, does from this Google? information become discoverable? Right. I, I like can that. definitely see that happening in a, a society as litigious as ours here in the States. <laughs> it was interesting. I, there was an article in Wired about this and uh, they were interviewing someone who said that uh, he, 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 he thought that, you know, every time uh, consumers uh, give up a little bit of their privacy that, you know, he thought this would be where they where they put their foot down. But, right. And but they, no. They don't. No. No. <laughs> We're so willing to just give up whatever we want for the next loyalty program. You know, it, then there's also the concern of how is this getting the information from the car? It has, it has to be using the CAM bus somehow. Yeah. Uh, I like that the protocols are open source, that they're going to be, so that means they're going to be able to be examined. People are going to be able to uh, assess them for security. But anytime something gets access to the CAM bus. You know, I'm not ready to panic here. I'm not ready to say, ah, it's going to crash your car. But I do remember <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember that uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek came into a Jeep and took over control of a Jeep through the CAM bus across the Wi-Fi access point on the car. Yeah, attack surface area. It's, again, we're talking about attack surface. And yeah. I, I don't know that this is going to be a real issue because the I think the app lives on your phone. Maybe the, the data is just going one way. I have no idea. I'm really not not sure. very uh, knowledgeable about this consortium or what their protocols look like. But you know, it it, it makes me a little curious. I'll say. Well, I, th you know, I think it's the shape of things to come. You yes. Know, you, you, you want, it's that old saying that, uh, you know, if you're getting something for free, you're the product. Right, exactly. That's, that's exactly right. All right, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining <laughs> us. My pleasure, Dave. And that's the CyberWire. 
Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can protect you from cyber attacks, head on over to Silence.com. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Our social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Our technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. <laughs>